So let's take Martin, he, him from the UK. It sounds like you want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. What you got for us? Well, uh, the evidence, <clears throat> I've got it in a book here. <laughs> I did try and memorize the information. Uh, well, the first evidence that after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph Arimathea in a tomb. So the, the member of the Jewish Sanhedrin who condemned Jesus. Now, the reason why people take this as fact is that Jesus' burial is attested in the very old information, CA, uh, less than AD 36, which was handed on by uh, St. Paul in his first letter to the Church of Corinth, Greece. Greece. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and the burial story is independently attested in the very old source material used by Mark in writing his gospel. And uh, given that there was hostility between the Sanhedrin and the Christian authorities at the time, it's unlikely they would have that would have been invented. So that's the uh, argument there, the first one. The second one, uh, the fact that he was found is very... The fact let's, that he wasn't let's, found... Let's just, stay with the first, let's just stay with the first one before we go on, uh, okay. Martin. So people, two ancient sources claim that a thing happened. Yes. How it, why is this evidence that this thing happened? Well, I would say that uh, it's just analysed historically. You know, we're not taking it as inerrant, I should say. It's not taken as infallible. It's just uh, a handful of documents passed on from the 1st and 2nd centuries. <clears throat> so, I don't so know. So when was Mark uh, written? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, G. Mark is the earliest, I believe, or the Q source, rather. And that was written about... We don't about have the Q source. We don't have 38. the Q source. No, that's quite true. But it is derived from, I think, parts that were believed to be Q, which is about we... 36 AD. Which when is, was Mark to be written? Fair, we don't have the Q Jesus source. Christ. We don't have yeah. the Q source. We have Mark. To be fair... When, when was okay, Mark written? We definitely... I don't know. <laughs> Mark was written around 70 uh, AD, so that's that's a good 40 years after the uh, resurrection event. So yes. Mark uh, wasn't... Well, I, Mark I would wasn't technically disagree witness. with that. I would say that the scholars I've heard of say that it occurred around... It was written around uh, maybe three years or so after Jesus' death. The, the consensus of scholarship, the consensus of scholars in the field think it was written around 70 AD. Yeah, the okay, other well, scholars I'm might disagree, but they would. They and I, I, I kind of, I'm a bit dubious when you say scholars uh, here. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to kind. I want to. Can you name names? Because I suspect you might be uh, referring to apologists, which are not scholars. And Ooh. I will go. Or they might be scholars, but they are biased scholars. And I'll go into that distinction if you want me to. But can you name names? Would you? Uh, yeah, I would. Uh... John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University. Okay. Uh, what's he saying? Well, he said that it's one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus, uh, that he was buried uh, by Joseph Aramathia. What's he saying about Mark? What's he saying about Mark? Oh, I see. I see. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have that information. Uh, but that, that's the question I, I asked you about. We, you, know, you, you said some people uh, disagree that Mark was written about 70 and put it about three years after the resurrection. Which scholars are putting Mark's should... gospel? Yeah, um, I would say that the information in Paul is also worth noting, and that probably... Okay, that, as it's, uh, uh, it, it, we're not talking about Paul, we're talking about Mark. Which scholars okay. are putting Mark's gospel at three years after the resurrection? I admit I don't know, but the sites I've seen right. suggest it was written in 50 AD, which is obviously a little after the event. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's okay. still 20 years after the event, but uh, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of interested in, in this fact that, you know, you're kind of, you, you've already just changed your mind on something. Uh, uh, yeah. Pretty quickly uh, yeah. into the conversation. Uh, yeah. So what is it that kind of, 
you know, where you're going, how are you assessing this information? Because if already you, you kind of, you've called in to present evidence for the resurrection and already yeah. within a couple of minutes of the conversation, you're saying, well, actually, I might be wrong on that particular point. So it's how true. are you actually assessing this information? What yardstick well, are you using are... to kind of assess it by? I would say there are sort of uh, six criteria you might use to justify sort of historical descriptions. <clears throat> and those would be uh, explanatory scope, explanatory power, uh, degree of plausibility, ad hocness, things like that, you know? That would be where, my basic. Where, where It sounds to me like you're reading this from somewhere and this is not kind of something you would personally use to assess a historical uh, claim. Yes, that's true. I'm reading, I, I have read a book called A Debate Between a Christian and an Atheist, which are written by William Lane Craig and uh, Walter Sinod Armstrong. That, that's where yeah. we're going wrong, sir. Yeah, That yeah. is where we're going wrong. And you know earlier when I made the, the statement that apologists are different to scholars? Here's why. Yes. You get people like William Lane Craig who they, oh. they, they, they assess what happened based on the conclusion that they want to make. So regardless yeah. of what counter information comes along, as I said, the consensus of scholarship says that Mark was written in 70 AD. Now, someone like William Lane okay. Craig, who is an apologist, a professional apologist, will dismiss mm. that scholarship simply, simply on the basis that it doesn't agree with his conclusion. That is not scholarship. No, you're that quite right. I agree. That is a really poor methodology to use. I agree that he uh, he doesn't, but I would say that he does regard these arguments as sufficient conditions, but not necessary conditions for belief. I mean, I've heard him say that. Okay, I've heard him say many things. I've, all, I've heard him say that the Colomb cosmological argument is the best argument he has ever heard until... Somebody presents mm -hmm. with, the, with the reason that it's not actually very good. And then he said directly, oh, yes, that's why I've changed. Uh, I've since changed my opinion on the Colomb cosmological argument. And the next time anybody speaks to him about the Colomb cosmological argument, he says, the Colomb cosmological argument is the best argument I have ever heard. He's dishonest. The yeah, man well, is yeah. dishonest. And this is easily demonstrable. So right. but let, mm -hmm. let's stop talking about uh, William Lane Craig and kind of get back to the evidence point of view. Ben, you want to jump well, in? Well, I just wanted to, to jump in and, and like what Richard was saying about like, it seems like you and, and William Lane Craig does this a lot too. Like you start with the conclusion. Like you st if you start with the resurrection happened and then you just do enough studying on things that could potentially be evidence for the resurrection like we're already having a problem in how we're thinking about it um because what we should do is we should start at i don't know if this thing happened or not let's look at yeah. studying it to see if there's evidence to suggest that it's true not not starting with oh i want this to be true so let me look for evidence that justifies why this is true do, do you see how the thought process mm -hmm. is different like and and this is something i'm willing to go with you and i think richard is too if if we started from a neutral ground of saying, I don't know if this thing is true or not, let's see what's out there. Like, I'm happy to go with you on that, but we we need yeah. we need to start there. Are you willing to start there and then kind of help us, like, understand yeah. where you're coming from with what evidence you think can would convince somebody that has no knowledge of the subject? Sure. What you got? Well, I mean, the second uh, piece of evidence I was thinking of is the fact that Jesus' tomb was found empty. So this is a test is sort of multiple times is transmitted. Well, okay, the but couldn't but couldn't a tomb be found empty for a variety of reasons? Like, okay, let's like let's let's reverse this a little bit. Just if if I gave you an example of something that like may or may not have happened um like 
For example, I went, like, if I said I went on a run yesterday and I saw a wolf that, like, jumped out of the bushes and then, like, tried to attack me and then I wrestled this wolf and, like, I have, mm -hmm. like, these scratches now and, like, this black eye. But, yeah, obviously this happened because of the wolf thing. Like, you don't know anything about that happening, right? I'd have to convince you a little bit that that was actually the thing that happened and not just what I'm saying happened. Like, yeah, it could yeah. be a possible explanation. But what are some other explanations that might have happened? Oh, yeah, I might have gotten lost on the trail and I ended up in some bushes and then I like ran into a tree with my mm -hmm. face and like I didn't want to sound stupid. So I came up with this other wolf yeah. story because I thought it make me look cooler, right? But like, so pretend like I'm a bystander, like just listening to the story. Like if you're coming up to me uh, and you're telling me this cool story about this resurrection of Jesus and I know nothing yeah. about the story, like I, I would reasonably be a little bit skeptical, right? Like, and you say, oh yeah, well, obviously Jesus rose from the dead because the tomb is empty now. And like, okay, but does mm. the tomb being empty mean that the resurrection happened? Like what other things could have caused that? Like, could somebody have moved a body? Was there even a body? Was Jesus as a person? Like, did this, like, there's so many arguments that you could take this, like, how, where do we, where do I go with it? So we have, we have the, uh, and I can't even say this is objective, but let's, let me grant you this really quickly. I'm not necessarily agreeing to this long-term, but like, let's just say hypothetically okay. that there was a tomb and it was empty. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What's the significance about the tomb being empty? Like, what does that specifically prove? Well, you're quite right that anything that looks miraculous could be wrong, uh, could be not be, be ambiguous, I mean. It also could be the case that someone had just, there are other explanations, you're quite right. Right, so uh, if, if it is not, that. so if that particular oh, piece of evidence does nothing to prove the point, why is that I, evidence? Why are you using that as evidence? I would say that uh, it's a good explanation if you already believe in God. You know, you need to believe in something. Right, so if above. you started it with the conclusion, it's evidence because you already had that conclusion. But if I don't have that conclusion, that's not convincing to me, right? Like, we need to start from, like, ground zero first and then add evidence. Like, you, like... That's what Richard and I are asking for here. Is we're asking for specific pieces of information that actually boost the case. Like you have to demonstrate that there is a relationship between this data and this claim and that there is a relation and that that relation would not exist without that particular piece of evidence. Like I have to see demonstration of that. Do you have anything like that for this uh, claim? Well... Uh, not on this particular claim. There are other evidences you might want to take into consideration, but uh, okay. So, I so mean, is it? Like, so, give us, so give us that evidence. But you have to demonstrate that it is evidence. Like, because when when sure. we say it's not just this is related to the, like when we say evidence, like evidence carries some weight. Like, and if it's going to carry weight, it needs to meet those criteria that I just mentioned for it to be able to carry that weight. And it has to be demonstrable to those who don't believe as well as those that do. It, it's not evidence yeah. if it only convinces those people who already believe the claim. Uh, in that case, um, the uh, fine-tuning of the universe? How does that, does that count as evidence? Well, it That's doesn't. It would show no. that something powerful created the universe. That's so, not oh, related at all to the resurrection, and it's also not evidence for what I, I think you're, you're thinking it is. Um, but how about, like, it, it sounds like you're running out of arguments for the resurrection. Well, Would it be safe <laughs> to say that you don't have evidence for the resurrection? Is that is that where we're getting at here? Well, I'd say that you need to assess the evidence by the standards of history. What I evidence? Sort of mentioned. That's, what, that's evidence? what we're well, trying right. to do, but we've not presented any evidence yet to assess. Okay, I guess from the scholars I've heard of, like Gerd Ludebaum, they seem to think that there is evidence that the disciples saw Jesus alive. Where you? I assume you are convinced that the resurrection happened, and correct me if I'm wrong. Well, 
I guess I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate. I don't entirely believe it's all real, but I believe they had a strong experience of something. Which okay. is a totally different claim than the entirely resurrection different. happening. Yeah. It's true, could be. Uh, it's a totally different claim, because, I mean, like, I, I'm the... Like the burden of proof needed to to prove that somebody had an experience that they thought somebody resurrected is way more plausible than somebody actually resurrected, right? Like I'm I'm it wouldn't take much to convince me that somebody thought something. Because people can think yeah. a lot of things that may or may not be true. So which which mm -hmm. is your argument? Because if if it's that they had an experience, I'm I don't know if I'm gonna put push back too much on that because like, I don't okay. really have a reason um, to. It doesn't really impact me at all if they had an experience or not. Well, I guess then, surprisingly, we agree. <laughs> it's okay. a very cordial uh, disagreement. <laughs> yeah, it, but, yeah, I, I mean, it's... Uh, we, I, Mark, uh, I hope you don't mind me uh, uh, saying, Martin, but you you came from the uh, the Atheist Experience fan group, uh, debate group. Yes, I did. Where you, you kind of made these claims on there as well, and I asked you to call into the show. And you, thank you for calling in. I appreciate that. It's uh, a right. do I'm enjoy it when people work. call from. The, <laughs> but, but no, and and I I do appreciate you calling in. But the conversation we're having on here yeah. seems to differ remarkably from the claims you were making in the group. You were seeming to well, suggest I, uh... in the group that these things are actually evidence of these things happening. Well, I think. I think that uh, I believe I well I am an atheist, but I do think that there are arguments that are not tested out enough, and I was trying to test them out. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of a compliment to your show. I uh, I did declare myself an atheist when I called in. <laughs> it's very kind of you to uh, talk to me. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate the call as well, Martin. We'll we'll let you go. Uh, thank you for calling okay. in. I do appreciate the call. Uh, it, and I love it when people call when whether it's from the TikTok or or the mm -hmm. or fan group, the Facebook groups. I love it when people do say they're going to call in and and do call in. 